Good morning. Welcome to Member Focus Monday. I'm Christina Schaefer, Social Media Manager for HAR, and I am joined for our very first program of the year uh, by 2021 Chair of the Board, Richard Miranda. Welcome, Richard. Good morning, Christina. How are you this morning? <laughs> I'm doing well, and Happy New Year to you and to all of our members that are tuning in today. Thank you. Happy New Year. I, <laughs> same thing for us, for everybody. And by the way, when coming up is going to be uh, uh, the Three Kings Day, which is a weekend and a holiday that's celebrated in Puerto Rico and in many other countries outside of the U.S. So. Yes, and you're actually from Puerto Rico, which you're going to tell us a little bit about in just a moment. Um, so, yes, uh, happy early celebration there as well. Um, if this is your first time ever tuning in for a Member Focus Monday, welcome. Again, this is our first program of 2021, so we're very happy to be here today. And say hello to us in the comments. And also, as you're going uh, through the program, if you have any questions for Richard, you can type them in and we will get to them. So just starting out, Richard, um, again, congratulations on um, being elected and, and now sworn in as our 2021 Chair of the Board. Um, you know, getting involved and you were very involved which you can tell us a little bit about some of the things that you do but getting involved is one thing running for the board is quite another but then also running to be on the executive committee that is a huge commitment so what uh what inspired you what made you want to get so involved with har well i i tell you it was just something that happened quite by accident i was uh involved in a lot of a uh, extra activities. I was involved in the International Advisory Group. I was in the MLS group, the com committees. I was also in, in Rita's um, uh, professional development group. I got a taste of what it is to be able to get involved in the, in the board and be able to contribute. Mm -hmm. So I said, why let's just take it another step. So I got uh, some some backing and support from my broker and our team leader and some of my uh, family members and I decided to run for the board of directors uh, you know what was it five years ago <laughs> and um, I got elected um, and then after that one year as a as a board member I said well you know I why don't we just go a little bit further and try to get more involved into the other aspects of of, of being a, a board member such as you know actual the actual real leadership so i ran for the executive committee and um i got elected uh about i think it was so, i try to remember it's been a blur so fast <laughs> it was four or five years ago i believe it right. is that, that it's, uh, we have a, like a four or five year Mm -hmm. uh, learning curve because this is a, a very important position and when we step into the as chairperson chairman or chair it we have to hit the ground running and and, and not stop for you know oh wait a minute i'm not sure how to do this so we we better know what we're doing <laughs> when we step into this position yeah exactly and learning curves is a great way to put it because you've seen some great leaders in the years ahead of you and, and able to kind of step into that role. Um, yep. it's, it's helpful to see those leaders lead. You also are very passionate about education and you yourself are an instructor. Uh, yes, I developed the, how do you call it, the, the passion for teaching. When I was in the Air Force, um, I was in the Air Force uh, during the <laughs> Vietnam War and um, I was going through tech school and an instructor, one of these uh, uh, high ranking officer walked into our classroom. I was uh, stationed at Chinook Air Force Base, which is in Illinois. And um, this high ranking colonel or one of those guys came into our classroom and asked us if we wanted to stay behind and be a volunteer instructor because they were building up for the Vietnam War and we needed to add a couple of shifts for the tech school. My, mm -hmm. Mine was a tech school and we were in the aircraft support equipment uh, maintenance school. So I said, hmm, maybe this is better than having to go to Vietnam or go someplace else. So I raised my hand and and I signed up for instructor training program. And as soon as the school was over, we ended up into a very, very ex, uh, intensive 
training program, mm -hmm. we were in, we were in a classroom from Monday to Saturday for seven weeks. I was told that 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 seven week intensive instructor training program was the equivalent of two years of college oh, wow. in terms of material for being being learned learning how to be an instructor and that's where i actually got my first taste of being an instructor and i said i love this <laughs> so i i was an instructor for the next three years while i was in the air force and when i got out of there i i wanted to go and finish college and become a history professor and uh well, it, it didn't work quite work out that way. <laughs> it took a little uh, bit of a different turn, yeah. <laughs> you're right, but you know, I, with the exception of one or two things that turned not the best way for us, everything else has been fine. Mm -hmm. So, I I was in the um, telecom industry prior to becoming a realtor, and I also became a trainer mm -hmm. in, uh, in my position. I was a, not just a sales guy; I was selling it telephone equipment and then start selling engineering services and consulting services. But I was also a, uh, an instructor for, you know, how to teach, we were teaching people how to use our software, how to use our hardware and things like that. So mm -hmm. I always stayed in, in the focus of the teaching thing. And then when, um, when I became a realtor in 2002, I saw the opportunity that there were so many training sessions and it says wow and this is like, wow this is like a instructor's paradise <laughs> we're, we're going everybody's going to training and thinking about getting educated and things like that so this is a natural so i went ahead and uh, my first certification was a cips instructor mm -hmm. and I, I went through the steps and i got uh, certified and then i became an abr and, and at home with diversity certified instruction i also became a, a texas texas realtors mce instructor so i can teach i can teach some mce courses and then um i happen to have been selected uh 2016 nar uh, awarded me the uh, the the privilege or the honor of being certified as a cips instructor of the year in 2016. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah, so. Well, thank Congratulations. you. So it's just one of these things that I just love to do. Absolutely. Yeah. And CIPS, for those that don't know, it's Certified International Property Specialist and International Real Estate is something that you're, that we know you are very passionate about. Um, getting into real estate a little bit, um, as we know, the inventory levels have been a cause for concern over the last year. Um, what are your expectations for the 2021 Houston area real estate market? We've had a, a, a shortage of inventory now for several years. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of those things that people just don't seem to have the desire to move up. I, I remember in my early years, uh, 2002 to around 2008, before the we had the debacle, we were selling up we had buyers who were selling their home. So we ended up capturing both sides with the selling side. And then when they turn around and sell the house, they were going to buy one. So we had a wonderful market called the move up buyers. But all of a sudden after the, uh, after the economy, uh, we had the downturn, uh, it just slowed down. The builders quit the bit, the developers quit developing and the builders quit building for a while. And that, kind of started to create a shortage, mm -hmm. which we have not actually, in my opinion, we have not actually come out of it. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people that I talk to in terms of, uh, you know, do you want to sell your house? And it says, well, not really. I don't have a place to go. So that's been a crux of the industry for a while now, the inventory shortage. And it is because most sellers are not willing to sell their property. Um, because they have no place to go on, or, or if they decide to do that, they go like, now nah, buying a new house is just way too expensive, which is another thing that has happened here in the last five years. Mm -hmm. We had, we had among the most, uh, the lowest and the cheapest and the least expensive and most affordable housing market in the United States. And it's, uh, it's not getting that way anymore. Mm -hmm. We've seen, we've seen these large, uh, humongous in, increases in property values 
And of course, due to the lack of properties, you know, supply and demand, it's uh, economics 101. If you don't have enough of a product, the prices end up going up. So we see that the property prices are going up because of the inventory shortage. And uh, that's what I see happening in 2021. It, with one exception, though, I think that by the beginning of summer, as the COVID uh, plague is, starts to uh, uh, become less of, uh, 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 harmful and, and more, we were able to, to overcome a lot of these things. Uh, we were able to beat it, mm -hmm. actually. I think we're going to see a lot of increase. So there's going to be a pent up demand of people who want to buy and sell. And I think we're going to see a tremendous upsurge in uh, home activity transactions and probably by the second half of 2021 yeah wonderful i, I hope you are right on that um so <laughs> some other expectations for the year um we mentioned that you have a passion for international real estate but you also have a passion for diversity and inclusion so what can we expect to see this year within our association in regard to international real estate as well as diversity and inclusion? Well, as far as international is concerned, we're gonna be more involved in uh, with uh, with our neighbors to the South. AMPI is uh, one of the largest real estate associations outside of the United States. And I have been for several years NAR's global ambassador for AMPI. Mm -hmm. And I've been teaching there, I taught uh, CIPS courses and I've taught ABR courses in, in Mexico. So there is a, a very, there's a hunger for learning and uh, training in Mexico by the real estate professionals down there. And even though they may not, all states in Mexico do not have a licensing requirement, that does not mean that my colleagues down there are, are, are they, they definitely know what they're doing. And there's a lot of prof professionals out there who are absolutely, perhaps I would say, just as if not more competent than some of the agents that we have here in our, in our own backyard and uh, so it is it is one of those things that they want to continue to increase the uh, professionalism levels and we'd be happy to help now that we now that i'm involved here with hr leadership i intend to help them as much as i can we're going to bring some people up here uh, like we have done in the past when i say people i'm talking about Ampi real estate members who want to learn how we do some things, we're going to continue to help them actively to pass uh, legislation in each of these individual states to to force the issue of registration and licensing because it's really the best way to protect the consumer mm -hmm. and, uh, and to protect property rights, which is one of the you know we got those were the main two core beliefs of of our society, of our association. Mm -hmm. And it, that's how the NAR Code of Ethics starts, you know, uh, below us is the land and that we have to take care of it and we have to help assess it and, uh, and, 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 and learn and show people how to highest and best use of the property. So those are the things that I wanna get involved in Mexico. Of course, we also have a, our friends in the North, in Canada, Canada is the second largest association, Canadian Real Estate Association, that is. Mm -hmm. They're the largest one outside uh, outside NAR. And they have a lot of things that are similar to us. The, the interesting thing is that Canada, even though they speak English and a lot of people think that Canada is very similar to the U.S., it's not. <laughs> the Canadians have a different mentality, a different attitude, a different uh, perception of life. And uh, you have to be in Canada for a while to understand that. And I do because I have traveled to Canada several times. I went to some trade shows <coughs> a couple of years ago. And I also, I'm gonna brag about this one. I also <coughs> taught the very first CIPS class in Canada in Calgary, Alberta, back in um, the 4th of July weekend in 2015. Mm -hmm. So that's where I got most of my learning and most of my education in terms of the Canadian real estate business, similar to ours in many cases, but the Canadians have a different uh, mentality. For example, 
if you buy if you buy a house with a mortgage, the mortgage will follow the the owner, not the house. Hmm. The uh, the uh, there is no uh, can't call expireds in Canada. Uh, it's against the law. And the other thing is that uh, there is no mortgage interest deduction. So there's some and some basic differences, but for the most part, mm-hmm. it's pretty much conducted the same way. But they do have a different mentality. So but that is a and and there is a lot of cross business. Canadians are buying property here in the U.S. just mm-hmm. like Mexicans are. Mm-hmm. Mexico and Canada are two of our biggest clients. Of course, there's also China and India, and believe it or not, Colombia. So we have to pay attention to this incoming flux of buyers, which is going to grow in 2021. Mm -hmm. We had the international buyers drop dramatically during the last four years. And I'm not going to go into politics, but it's a reality that our, our environment, our business and our immigration and our immigration policies and our immigration environment and our and our and our environment about bringing uh, foreigners into the U.S. had had been different in the last four years, mm-hmm. and I think it's going to change for the better. I think we're going to end up with a lot more foreign buyers in 2021 that we did. We're going to see an upsurge in that. That's and wonderful. the Canadians going to buy here. They go. They buy in Florida. They buy in Texas. They buy in, 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 in where it's in warm. Arizona. <laughs> If that's what they want to do, we'll be happy to oblige them. Yeah, they want to be where it's warm because they're they're cold up there. <laughs> the same with the Mexicans. The Mexicans mm-hmm. uh, are are be, they want to buy here. Mm-hmm. They want to be able to own a property here, and uh, it, we would be foolish if we don't pay attention to this incoming growth market, mm-hmm. which I know is going to explode in 2021. Okay, so for international real estate, it sounds like a heavy emphasis on education and um, on assisting with, with property rights and things like that. Um, yes. As far as diversity and inclusion, uh, what should we expect to see as an association? There was a heavy emphasis on it last year, but I know that's something that you're passionate about. So what can we expect to see in 2021 as far as diversity and inclusion is concerned? Well, we've seen a lot of hate language being posted on Facebook about uh, racism and, and prejudice and things like that. Mm-hmm. And is there's just no room for that here in our association and our in our life there should not be that kind of uh, of racism and prejudice and, and and hate it's just it's just I don't want to sound like I'm a religious zealot but that to me that's a little bit of in the moral side mm-hmm. and if you want to look at it from a practical point of view it's bad for business. Mm-hmm. Because if you start excluding groups of people because of their not like you, you're going to end up hurting your own business because it's not going to grow. We have to continue to include other other races and religions and beliefs and ethnicities in our in our in our in our client base because it's. You know, morally is the right thing to do, and second, this is just good for business mm-hmm. to increase our business with uh, with foreign buyers and people from other ethnicities that are that are want to become homeowners. Absolutely, so, and then with the expansion of the code of ethics as well, there's yeah. there's going to be yeah. some actual regulation with that as far as that's concerned too. So I you brought that up. We had um, we had a vote at the NAR positions uh, a few months ago, and we. Uh, amended the code of ethics to to create an awareness that uh, many of us, without realizing it, many of us have uh, what I call implicit bias, mm. and it it may not be racist, but it is pretty much close to it, and we have to dig inside ourselves and realize that we have it even though we don't recognize it and we don't think we have it we we do all of us have some sort of implicit bias towards a specific ethnicity or race or color or religion and that's what we have to get rid of we are going to be also doing in every every session of uh family we have the uh for the new agents we have the orientation Mm-hmm. We're going to be spending some time talking about diversity and inclusion 
to the new members of HAR because it's uh, it's 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 just a really the right thing to do. Yeah, wonderful. And that's they're just getting into the business. Get them trained yes. <laughs> from the beginning. That's that's excellent. Yeah. And I know that. Um, there's going to be additional webinars and things throughout the year for people to look into as well. So wonderful. Um, I'm just yeah. curious, you, uh, you moved, you moved from Puerto Rico to the United States to, to Arkansas, I believe. Oh yeah. Yes. We and was, was a long way around. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And then you came to Texas, but did that move from Puerto Rico, uh, to the U S did that? inspire you to get so invested in international real estate because maybe of, as your experience as a client yes actually you know when you're born in an island it you have to you have to expand your horizon so mm -hmm. it was uh i think people that are born and raised in the island of puerto rico end up being travelers because they want to explore other things other than their <laughs> tiny island yeah. puerto rico is very very small Mm -hmm. It's 100 miles long and 35 miles wide. It's been a U.S. territory since 1898. So we've been U.S. citizens um, for, you know, well over 100 years. But because it's so small, people tend to move out and grow and, and, and fly and drive and, 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 and travel. So we've done that all. My wife and I, got we got married, we honeymoon in Rome and in, 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 in Portugal because mm -hmm. that's just typically what, what most people. Uh, people that live in the island do. But so, you know, you grow up with this mentality about traveling and internationalism because we realize that we're just a tiny island and just a very small speck in the entire world. So you, you kind of like grow with that mentality that let's just look at the rest of the world. Let's be, let's be global. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I, and I, my, my move to Little Rock, Arkansas was strictly a, a, a decision of, uh, a job. I was in the phone company. Um, I started, I've been in the phone business for many, many years prior to becoming a realtor. Mm -hmm. And um, I was an outside pet engineer, an outside plant engineer for the phone company. And I moved to Little Rock, Arkansas because they were hiring contract outside plant engineers and they were making good money. So I became a, I was, I became a staff engineer outside plant in one of the small rural telephone companies. We lasted we lived there for two years and uh, we had an opportunity to move to Houston after two years in Little Rock. I love Little Rock. Little Rock is mm -hmm. just a great place to live. It's just a really nice, close knit community. Uh, both my wife and I had been uh, by are bicultural and bilingual because we had spent time not just in Puerto Rico, but we had lived part of our lives in the U.S. My wife is an army brat, so she lived in a Petersburg, Alaska, uh, Petersburg, Virginia, uh, Fairbanks, Alaska. I lived in Illinois. I lived in, in Illinois. And then we lived in, in several other places. So we both knew uh, what bilingual and bicultural was. So, and so we did the, we did, we made the jump from Puerto Rico to Little Rock. And uh, from there, we moved down here in, uh, in November of 78. So we've been here in Houston now for over 40 years. Mm -hmm. We have two grown sons that they were both born in Puerto Rico, but they grew up here in Houston. So they're, they, they call themselves Texas Ricans. <laughs> Just a quick comment. Uh, yeah. Nelly, Nelly said about Puerto Rico. She said it's small, but mighty. <laughs> yes. Very good. So and then, I, and then I ended up getting a job with the phone company here and uh, the uh, telephone company manufacturer of telephone equipment. And I was traveling because I was bilingual and I had a U.S. passport. I was a natural. I ended up getting this international sales job. And I was traveling all over Mexico, South America, Central America. I did that for, my gosh, almost 20 years, mm -hmm. traveling all over Latin America. So I got to know. So the, international uh, travel yeah, real I mean, estate, I, is it's ingrained in you. <laughs> well, I tell you, yeah. when I when I when I made my career move from the telecom industry to the real estate, I approached some of my old real estate uh, uh, telecom clients in Mexico, and some of them became my clients in, in terms of real estate. We had two or three of my old colleagues and people that I knew, acquaintances, that decided to move to Houston, and when they found out that I had, 
when they found out that I was a realtor and I had a real estate license, it was natural. They called me and so they became my clients again. <laughs> this is a different industry. That's wonderful. So yeah, I've, 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 I've been bitten with the international global bug for you know, since typically since the, I was growing up in Puerto Rico. So yeah, wonderful. So you and, talked and to us. It was a natural extension. Yes, makes sense. You, you've talked to us a, about your your goals and, and priorities for 2021. Um, we talked a little bit about the real estate market and the concern where, where inventory comes in. With all of that being said, what, what changes or challenges do you foresee in the real estate market uh, or in the real estate industry, I should say, yeah. uh, this year? We're going to see a lot of these more institutional buyers. We had uh, the iBuyers who kind of like went to sleep after uh, during the COVID, but they're coming out with a vengeance. And the iBuyers are going to fit into a specific niche of sellers who don't want to deal with the traditional process. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. That's going to happen. Uh, there's always been these investors who buy houses directly from, from, from sellers without doing the real the, the regular process as we know it. But I think that it's going to continue to be, uh, they're going to grow a little bit more. There's a lot of companies out there who have spent a lot of money, a lot of capital building up their inventory. Everybody is going to be wanting a piece of the pie. And I think it's going to continue to grow. The I buyers, which I call it institutional buyers. Mm -hmm. It is going to put a little bit strain on us as realtors because we're going to start thinking, well, am I relevant? And the answer is yes. <laughs> Don't ever think that real estate, a real estate agent is going to become a thing of the past. It probably eventually will, but not in the next few years. Mm -hmm. I think that we're going to still be relevant. People are still needing counseling and advice. And, and so there's always going to be the need for a real estate agent who's going to be helping people make decisions about buying or selling. Mm -hmm. Buying a house is not like buying a car. It's not like buying a TV set. Buying a house is a large financial investment decision. And it's an also an emotional one. And there's a lot of people out there who cannot handle that type of uh, transaction on their own. So they need our services to be able to help them understand the uh, the nuances and the complexities of transferring a house from owner A to buyer B. Mm -hmm. So we're going to continue to be relevant. But what we, and I see that we're going to have an uptick in, in 2021 because we had, uh, even though we have had record sales during the COVID, we are we we're buying, you know, where people are buying houses, but they're not listing. So, we, but we're going to see an up, an up, an uptick in terms of the uh, the amount of people who are going to be placing their houses on the market. And now that they see that they're going to get a lot more for their, even in my own neighborhood, I'm I'm kind of like pleasantly surprised that uh, we've broken a barrier of three hundred thousand dollars. I mean, most of the houses where I live were like. 220 to 50 to 40 and now we started seeing houses the same houses that were selling you know 10 years ago for 220 and 240 they're already passing 300,000 mm -hmm. and I'm going like holy cow that that's good for for us the homeowners because as we see our our our, our equity growing we get tempted about maybe putting the house on the market and making more money and uh getting a little bit more out of the houses and then moving into something better i think i hope and i believe that we're going to be able to see more of the move up buyers that we had seen during the early 2000s okay that makes sense and um, so technology technology is also a very important issue we're going to continue to see upgrades and updates and, and improvements that are in our technology if which are going to make our job easier mm -hmm. Uh, you know, example is the the uh, the internet. The internet. You know, people thought that the internet was going to be the demise of the real estate agent, and actually has not. <laughs> We've been able to do our jobs far quicker and better by using the tools that the internet has given us. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, it's just, 
I would say that these doomsayers are, are I, I think they're a little bit. Uh, a little off base. <laughs> off. Yeah. yeah. I, think, I think we're going to still be around. I think what we else can are we going to yeah, yeah. I, I think we can all agree that, um, you know, the internet will only take you so far as far as whether you're buying a home or researching to sell your home, you, you need an, an expert. Um, yeah. And you, you made the, a couple of people had a question about you saying that one day we might be irrelevant. I know you, Richard, and I don't think you really believe that we will, that realtors will ever be irrelevant. Yeah, not for a while anyway, yeah. it'll be a while. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, Shannon had a, a quick question. Do you foresee more short sales or foreclosures this year? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. I, I think we're going to have an uptick in the uh, foreclosures. That's inevitable. A lot of uh, a lot of the lenders that have been, in some cases, been given uh, forbearance to some of the mortgage holders. I think they're going to run into a situation by uh, the fall, uh, excuse me, by the spring or the summer, where the uh, the forbearances are are, are are ended, and people are not going to have the money. So they're going to have to stack them. They're going to have to tack them up in the back end and just link, add to the length of the mortgage overall. From say, you know, we've got ten years to go, then you're going to end up you're going to end up at ten years and six months. Mm -hmm. But I think there's also going to be a lot of people who are just not going to be able to continue to pay their homes, uh, their mortgages. And I, I think I'm afraid that that's going to cause a little bit of an uptick in the foreclosures and the evictions. And as much as uh, the, uh, the, the, the landlords have been able to subsist without having the income of the rents and the banks are desperate for you know cash because the lenders uh need the money from their mortgagees to be able to continue their business so it's a circle and uh, somebody has to at one point the money has to start recycling and the recirculating mm -hmm. in our business and and if we don't if we don't start uh, recovering uh, and getting jobs back we're going to see some updates and of course this is a job-driven economy. This is a job-driven industry. People who do not have jobs do not buy houses. So mm -hmm. we have to make sure that we create or, or we return people to their jobs as the pandemic starts to, uh, to, um, to uh, just disappear and, and we're able to beat it. So yeah. I, should also, I, I, I should also mention that uh, this... Wednesday, we do have Dr. Ted C. Jones. Um, he is going to be uh, speaking for us. It is a free event this year put on by the HARYPN. So go take a look at, at that. If you're watching this recording after that event has taken place, we will be recording um, the Ted C. Jones event. And I, as I mentioned, he's the chief economist for Stuart Title. He always gives us a great presentation at the beginning of the uh -huh. year. So he might be able to answer those, some of those questions for us too. I believe that he's a guru and a soothsayer and that a lot of people uh, are going to be uh, learning new things because he's 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 kind of like a like a he's got a crystal ball. Well, he says he does not have it, <laughs> but we think he, he gets a lot of this information from statistics and trends mm -hmm. because that's what he is. He's an economist yes. and economists have, have the that, that gift of being able to foresee the future based on looking at the, the, the current statistics yeah yes and i believe i said that event was on wednesday it's actually on thursday so uh, we can put a link to that in the comments so that people can sign up for it um well very good uh richard i think uh somebody's singing your praises in the comments nelly says hr has the perfect cheer person for this year as diversity and inclusion and our international are going to be a forefront of our industry what a blessing to have someone like Richard Miranda guide us through it. And we couldn't agree more. Um, Richard, thank you so much for taking time today to let us know a little bit about who you are and what your goals and, and challenges and plans are going to be for this year. I hope everyone has a, has a wonderful week and we will see you next Monday at 9 a.m. Bye-bye, everyone. Thanks. All right. Bye-bye.